Uh, okay, thanks everyone for, for coming. I know it's late in the day uh, after a couple of very busy sessions. Um, if, um, uh, you know, um, if any of you want to go grab a beer and come back, that's cool too. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little, uh, uh, it's been going on for a while. Um, but anyways, thanks for joining us very much. Um, I'm Carter Page. I'm the lead manager for Bigtable uh, at Google, which includes the Cloud Bigtable team. And we have George McMullen, who's the Senior Director of Product at iCharts. Hi, everybody. And the two of us, we're going to be presenting about uh, BigQuery Federated Queries on Cloud Bigtable and how iCharts uses it. So cutting straight to the chase, we just announced this morning that you can now run high-speed SQL queries on unstructured data in Bigtable. So you don't need to hook up your Hive or anything else like that. You can just uh, connect BigQuery, and now you've got SQL. You can basically turn Bigtable into another virtual table in BigQuery and do everything you can do um, with BigQuery on top of it. Um, so the advantages of using this approach is you can query uh, row ranges. So um, the same, if you can uh, select row keys, basically start in row, in row keys in Cloud Big Table when you're doing queries uh, through BigQuery, and you can get very fast results um, as long as you're kind of ranging that data. Um, if you do full table scans over terabytes, it's not going to be as fast as BigQuery is. And it's not exactly what this connector is optimized for, but you can do it in batch mode. I'll talk a little bit more about the performance trade-offs, why this is, et cetera, as we go along. Uh, the important thing is it supports SQL. Um, it supports both the legacy SQL and standard SQL. There is some performance optimizations that are coming on the standard SQL in the next couple of weeks. Um, and I'll also talk about that a little bit. And uh, all the time while you're running BigQuery against a live, real-time Cloud Bigtable database, you can still use the Cloud Bigtable interface for the low latency reads and writes that it provides. And by connecting Bigtable to BigQuery, it also connects Bigtable to the BigQuery ecosystem. So anything that can read from a BigQuery table can now read from a Bigtable table. Okay, so we're going to run through, here's the agenda basically. I'm going to run through real quick how BigQuery works. And then I'm going to go into some detail about how Bigtable works. I'm going to talk then specifically about the BigQuery Bigtable connector and some of the trade-offs, like how to use it, when to use it, why not, when not to use it. Then we're going to get in and do a demo, and we're actually going to set up the connector and run BigQuery against a Bigtable. And then iCharts is going to come in and show how they plug into this connector as well. So stepping back a little bit, the broader road roadmap here, Google Cloud Platform has seven different storage products, uh, ranging from, uh, from a memcache all the way up to a data warehouse. And what we're going to be focusing on today are these two, about Cloud Bigtable and BigQuery. These two databases are what we refer to in, as our analytics databases. And they have different strengths and weaknesses. There's trade-offs for them. So what Cloud Bigtable is designed for is for being able to you know, scale to petabytes and beyond and be able to provide very fast uh, very fast single value reads and writes. So spot reads and writes in single digit milliseconds, even out on the long tail, like 99% uh, you know, beyond. Uh, what BigQuery is specialized for is the ability to take terabytes of data and do aggregation across it and do aggregation analysis and return results in just a few seconds. Um, the, converse, you know, the, the inverse of those is not true, is, is not, is not actually true though, BigQuery cannot do very fast individual spot reads and writes. And while you can do scans over Cloud Bigtable, it's not optimized for it in the same way that Cloud, that, sorry, that BigQuery is. And so large scans will end up taking minutes. And I'll talk again a little bit why that is. But the basic gist of it is that the architecture of the two systems are different. So Cloud Bigtable is row-based. All of your data is basically stored one row at a time, and so the files that underlie Big, Big Table are sets of rows. So one file contains a set of rows. BigQuery, on the other hand, is actually each file is a column, um, or you know, you know uh, or is actually a, each column is a set of files. So if you have 20 different columns in BigQuery and you read two different columns from the same row in BigQuery, they're reading from different files. And and I'll explain a little bit more why that uh, affects the relative uh, performance characteristics of the two. Okay, so <clears throat> quick dive into how BigQuery works. It's a fully managed, no ops data warehouse. When you hear uh, we have data warehouse, star schema, those sorts of things, that's where your BigQuery comes in. Petabyte scale, it's super, super paralyzed for speed. You ask a question of it, we'll spin up, uh, you know, 
tons and tons of workers to analyze your data uh, and charge you just for the seconds that it's up, you know, give you the response back and spin them down. It has the convenience of SQL, so you don't need software developers to ask simple questions of your data. And it's durable and highly available, like uh, uh, and it's with similar characteristics to Bigtable. The basic journal architecture um, for, the, for the, I guess, its first decade, I think this was published in a paper around in the late 2000s. And basically what you have is it's sort of like a, um, um, a, a on-the-spot map reduce. You essentially have these leafs that will each be assigned to a chunk of data in BigQuery, and they will go analyze it. They will aggregate the results, send it up to the next layer, to the level one of mixers, which in turn will aggregate again and send it up to the, the top mixer. In 2015, we developed a Dremel X architecture, which simplified and actually sped it up, where you really just have one master talking to all the shards to aggregate things up. And underneath, these talk to this columnar storage, which in, in 2016, uh, we replaced the, tr the previous column IO storage with capacitor, which is faster, especially when uh, dealing with the, uh, with the encryption at rest that we do for everything at, uh, at Google. And as I mentioned here, if you're, you know, the, the important thing of having a columnar store when you're doing large aggregate queries is, say you have a table that has 100 different columns, and you, know, you want to be able to read, you know, aggregate the values in column A based on the values in column J. Uh, BigQuery will basically you know, just rip through those two columns and you know, will spread those out and aggregate them and return the results back. If you did the same thing on Bigtable, however, Bigtable would be reading every single row as you go along just because of the way it's stored. And that's, that's, uh, that's by design in terms of you know, what they're intended for. Okay, so I'll go into how Bigtable works. There's some slides that were in some of the other big table, table talks today. I just want to get a sense here, like how much I need to go into deep dive on this. How many people have been to other deep dive Bigtable sessions today? Okay, all right, there's enough people who haven't, so I'm, I'm not gonna rush through this. So Cloud Bigtable, it's a fully managed NoSQL database. Basically kicked off the NoSQL revolution in uh, mid 2000s. Uh, it led to a bunch of, uh, a bunch of fun um, uh, open source solutions that uh, imitated or t either took direct uh, clones of the architecture described in the paper or were heavily influenced by it. This includes HBase, Cassandra, Hypertable, the NSA built one, I think it's called Accumulo. Um, and it's basically inspired a whole family of databases out there. Um, the thing that's the, the basic important characteristic about it is it's incredibly scalable, so it can scale petabytes, hundreds of petabytes, whatever, uh, and it's very, very low latency. So even with large data, even if you're pounding it with a million QPS, you get very tight, uh, low latency even at the tail, single digit milliseconds typically. It supports sequential row scans, so uh, the data is actually, you know, uh, the, the row keys are stored sequentially, think of it like alphabetical order, and this allows you to do some clever things in terms of optimization. So, for example, one of the examples we'll give in the demo is, um, is the idea of stock ticker data over time. And so if you prefix your row key with a stock ticker, you can tell it, hey, I want to read the data for this stock ticker during this window, and it will only read that data there. The other thing that's nice about it is under the covers, because they're stored together, so like we're gonna look at the stock ticker GUG for Google, um, when you start reading the first entry, the first row for that, it's gonna go to the file system and they're stored together in the same files. It's already gonna have pulled that file into memory into the block cache of the file system and so it's actually very fast doing scans. Um, not quite as fast as BigQuery for the reasons I outlined, um, but, but still pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, and then the other thing is it learns and adjusts to access patterns. So as you, as you have diurnal patterns during the day where you're going hot or you're going cold uh, on different areas of the data, Bigtable will learn about this and will rebalance. And I'll show this, uh, how this works. Um, so here's basically what a Bigtable looks like you know, conceptually. Um, you could have millions of columns, so it can be very wide columns. Uh, you want to have a single row to have, um, uh, to have less than 100 megs, um, but apart from that, you have kind of no constraint on the number of columns you throw into a row. Uh, each, it's a sparse table, meaning that you could have a billion rows and each of the billion rows could have a different million columns than each of the other rows, and it doesn't affect the space. You only pay for the row column intersections that you use. 
you'll notice that the row keys are sequential. That was the lexicographic or alphabetical order, or ordering of the row keys I mentioned. And then the, at the top, there's this notion of column families. In this case, it's follows and friends. And that's the only schema definition that happens in Bigtable. You'll define a column family, or you may, may define multiple column families. And then the columns themselves are actually not defined until uh, insertion time. So when you, when you make a mutation, that's when that column first appears. And it may only appear in one row, uh, or it may appear in many rows. That's really up to you as the application developer. So there's a lot of flexibility, particularly if you're ingesting things with unpredictable schemas. This is one of the reasons that it's a, it's a great fit for IoT, where you can get some kind of surprising properties from, from different devices. And the last thing I'll point out in this slide is that the database is three-dimensional. So you have your row, you have your column, and then we'll, we'll store whatever number of versions you want. Uh, you, could store, you could store them forever, or you could put a TTL or a max number of versions you know, to kind of manage your, your data size. All right. So this is the big table architecture in a nutshell. Um, the left is kind of a, a deep dive into like what, what's inside of a tablet server, and I won't go into the details of that. Um, that'll, that would take a while. Uh, if you're curious, go read the OSDI paper from 2006 in Bigtable. It goes into gory detail in terms of how Bigtable works and how it operates uh, and scales the way it does. The important thing to notice here is you've got your Bigtable client, and it's talking to a pool of tablet servers, and each tablet server will represent a certain amount of data that's stored in Colossus, which is our file system. And the, the important thing there is the data is not actually stored in the tablet servers. So they're essentially stateless, and they represent and they pin the data from Colossus. And it's our high-speed networks that allow, uh, allow this separation to happen without any performance degradation. Uh, then we have a master does coordination, and we have Chubby, which is kind of like if you ever heard of Zookeeper, it's kind of the same thing. Um, so when you connect to Cloudbig Table from outside, you talk to a load balancer proxy, and then it will actually send you to the to the Big Table nodes. But we're not going to talk about the load balancer proxy right now. It's kind of it's kind of abstracted out uh, as far as you're concerned, and we'll talk about kind of how how things work inside. So we talked about the nodes being separated from the storage, and this allows you to do two cool things. So one is it you can um, uh, you can easily move data around, essentially. So imagine you have a situation where you have this node on the left that's getting a lot of access patterns. Maybe, maybe it's, it contains data for a certain region of the country that just woke up. Uh, and what Bigtable will do is it will recognize this in a matter of seconds, and then it will send a signal to that node to unload the data, and then it'll send a, node, a signal to the other node to load the data and start serving this. Uh, and this happens in you know, uh, a couple of seconds, sometimes hundreds of milliseconds, it is, uh, it's practically imperceptible. It'll, it will, whoever happened to be right at that moment might get a little bit of latency on the very long tail, like four nines or something like that, but for all intents and purposes, it's transparent. And this is happening all the time. It's very aggressive at rebalancing to keep things uh, even. The other nice thing is you can resize, too, kind of on the fly. So you don't, uh, if, you need, if you need to throw more nodes on, unlike, say, Cassandra HBase, you're not also throwing more disk with the nodes themselves. You can spin up and spin down nodes to increase your throughput, increase your QPS. You could do that for a batch, and then after the batch is done, spin it back down again if you like. Um, and because it keeps the, the balancing nice and even, and because the nodes actually don't talk to each other, you don't get that kind of exponential price that typically comes from distributed systems, or often comes from distributed systems. And so it goes in a straight line from, uh, you know, here are three nodes, the 30 nodes, and the, the, oh, by the way, so we kind of give a guidance of 10,000 QPS per node, uh, and that's kind of what we show on the, uh, you know, on the console. And that's based off of a load test of uh, one, one kilobyte uh, payloads, mixed read-write 50-50. Um, if you have very large rows that are like 100 megs, you're going to get much lower than this. If you have much smaller rows that are 10 bytes, you'll get much, much greater than this. So this is just a rule of thumb. The most important thing to do if you're trying to actually figure out how to scale it is run your own load against it. The important point from this is that you can trust Bigtable to scale linearly. So as you keep increasing up, you, the, uh, the number of nodes will increase your, your load throughput proportionally. And in fact, we had a customer last year who did a load test just to kind of prove they could, and we wanted to prove we could, where he ran 3,500 nodes and got 35 million QPS. Now, the thing that's really cool about 35 mil the 35 million QPS is they were actually persistent and durable QPS. These were two disks. If you had 
chopped, uh, if you turned off the power right in the middle of it, you wouldn't have lost a single byte when it came back up again. Um, so its performance is comparable to an in-memory database. Okay, so uh, the connector here. Uh, so, as I mentioned, each database has its own trade-offs. So, because BigQuery is column-based, it allows you to query terabytes in seconds um, and aggregate that data really quickly. Cloud Bigtable being row-based and because of other parts of its architecture, uh, gives you single-digit millisecond latency. So, very fast. Um, to use both, sometimes people want both aspects of this, and that's why we built this connector. You previously had to dual ingest in terms of building a system, maybe using a pub sub with a data flow, writing into both systems, hoping they stay kind of in sync, and then you know, sending one program to one or the other, depending on what your use case is. So the federation, uh, this federated connector that we're releasing today, um, basically replaces the column IO store that's at the bottom of the BigQuery diagram and just puts a big, big table in there. So you can basically tell BigQuery, like either go to your native store, or you can point it to the Bigtable APIs, and it basically treats Bigtable as you know, an application would uh, talking to Bigtable. The benefits of this is you get SQL in a cloud Bigtable, and that's pretty cool, because if you have a simple question about your, your data, previously you would have to either go you know, instrument something like Hive, or you'd have to go have a developer write a program and run a MapReduce and hopefully get that answer to you, you know, in the next few hours or something like that. Now you can do ad hoc queries. You can keep them canned. People who are not developers can actually, you know, can, can ask questions about the data that's in there. Uh, once you have this connector in place, you can use the same tools that work against BigQuery. And, you know, that, that's why we have iCharts up here, to, and they're going to show off uh, a little bit about what that allows you to do. Uh, no table partitioning is required. Um, so if you're familiar with BigQuery, BigQuery does, big, does full table scans. And if you're doing something like uh, warehousing all your data over time, you'll want to partition your data like into days or weeks or something like that so that you're not reading you know, five years of data when you're just curious about two days or something like that. Um, Bigtable solves this by providing row ranges. And rather than defining it ahead of time, you define your row ranges at query time, and it will just select the data that you requested and return that. And so as long as you're keeping the row ranges small, the query times will be, will be very fast in you know, one or two seconds. And now you only have, for the people who, uh, were, you know, people who this is a good connector for, you only are storing your data in one place. And that simplifies things a bit, too. BigQuery is seeing the same real-time data that Bigtable is. The trade-off, as I mentioned before, is full table scans are going to be slower. If you still want to do lots of ad hoc full table scans all day long and return in really, really quick times, you may still need to, use, to do this dual ingest. If you're doing smaller subsets of the day, you're probably going to be just fine with a connector on top of Bigtable. And the other thing I want to point out is that Bigtable connector is read-only. So unlike BigQuery, you can read out of a BigQuery, get some results, read it into another BigQuery table. You can't do that with Bigtable. However, you can do everything else you can do with a reading with a read-only connector on BigQuery. You can join a Bigtable read with some uh, with data on a BigQuery table. You could even join two Bigtable columns together, uh, or two sorry two Bigtable tables together. All right, so let's uh, let's stop talking and start typing. Um, let's see, can we switch over to the laptop? Okay, so I have an instance here. Um, it is uh, called GCP demo. And I have it sitting in US Central 1C. And this is important because BigQuery resides in two regions. It resides in US and it resides in Europe. And because of the amount of data that it's reading, you need to co-locate your, uh, your Bigtable in the same region. So here we have it in the zone US Central 1C, which is in the same region as the, as the BigQuery US region. Um, OK, so let's take a look at the data here. Um, so we're going to use this tool called, uh, called CBT. Um, if you use Bigtable and you, uh, and you haven't uh, used uh, CBT before, then you should grab it. It's a G Cloud component, and it makes it really easy to do simple admin things for the command line. It's a lot easier than like using the HBase admin tools or whatever. Um, and, um, and so here I just basically said, all right, read, read the first row of you know, the data in this table, ticker and start uh, with the, row, the first row that matches the prefix GUG. So we see actually the opening, uh, the opening day on the stock market for Google on uh, August 19th, 2004, and it closed at $50 that day. Uh, we've got a high and a low and an open. The volume there is zero. Some of the data in here is uh, on, 
based on what, what year it was or whatever, uh, is some, for both the volume and the open, uh, can sometimes be zero. So it's just an artifact of the data, essentially. Um, but we want to do, I mean, if you wanted to actually start looking at more of this data, using this interface quickly becomes very clumsy and hard to actually parse. So what we want to do is actually make a BigQuery table so we can actually do something, do something interesting with it. Um, so let's see. Da, da, da. OK, so um, we're going to create a new data set first. We're going to call it demo. And as I mentioned before, we're going to put it in the US. So it's co-located with the big table that we have running in US Central 1C. So I click OK. And so that's created. That's pretty fast. So then what we have to do is we have to tell BigQuery how to talk to Bigtable. The trick here is Bigtable has no notion of typing. It's all binary data. Bigtable doesn't know what an if you're storing an integer or a string or a movie or some ciphertext or, or whatever. It's just you just store bytes in it. So we need to tell BigQuery when it's reading from certain columns what the type of that data is. <clears throat> and the way we do that is this is the, this is the whole uh, this is the only slightly complicated aspect of the connector, is you just define a JSON file. Um, if you get this, everything else is, is brain dead simple. Um, so this JSON file is, uh, uh, starts with a format, and you have a, strong, you have a um, reserved term for the format for Bigtable. So you put in all cats Bigtable, and then it will be looking for a source URI to define where that Bigtable lives. So we point to the Bigtable API, so googleapis.com slash Bigtable. We point to the project name, sorry, the project ID. Uh, I point to the instance ID, and I point to the table ID. Then we set up our options. So the first option that's here uh, is, is actually pretty important. It's read row key as string. So 90% of the time, probably more, you want to use row key, you want to use strings as your row keys on big table. It gives you the most kind of flexibility, particularly if you're uh, concatenating a bunch of different types of data together. The important thing in this case is if you, if you give BigQuery a, a string row key and you say, hey, this, you know, my row keys are all strings, then BigQuery will know how to be able to select between individual ranges. And that's the key to actually having a fast connector. So when you're, when you're selecting between two, you know, between two particular rows and it's, you know, you're reading that 100 rows or 1,000 rows or 10,000 rows or whatever, not maybe the whole billion rows that are in that table. The second thing, uh, only read latest. This is, you usually want this set to true. Now, if you recall, Bigtable is a three-dimensional database, so each column or row intersection can have any number of versions. It's interesting for historical purposes. Usually, you just want the latest one. If you don't, you can, leave the, you can set this to false, but you typically want this to true. And then you actually define out your column families. In the simple example we were working with today, I have one column family just simply called T. And so we specify the column family ID there. And then I specify a type here, which in this case is a string. Um, and by in this case, I'm, I'm saying that every, all the data in this column family happens to be a string. That doesn't have to be the case. You could either set a default and then override in columns that are different, or you could set each column to be a different type. You could say this is a string, this is an integer. Um, and it's, but it's important to set the correct type so BigQuery knows how to correctly parse your data or how to turn those bytes into the correct, the correct data you're looking at. And then here's the individual columns. And you can see these match up with, uh, with what we saw before looking at the raw big table data. Symbol, close, date, et cetera. All right. So the way we actually create the, um, create the new virtual table is fairly simple. We use another command line tool. This is BigQuery's uh, G Cloud component called BQ. And again, if you use BigQuery, you should probably have this tool because it makes your life a lot easier. Um, we call the mk command to make a new table. And we specify the project ID of the BigQuery. Um, they're coincidentally the same place, but just pointing out this is not the big table project. This is the BigQuery project. We specify the external table definition, the JSON file that we just looked at. And then you say the new data set that we created, demo, and then a dot and then the name of the new BigQuery table. Note that's not the name of the BigTable table. That's specified inside the JSON file itself. We're specifying the name of the virtual query that we want to be, have queryable inside of BigQuery. And we do that, and after a long time, it's done. OK. So um, we go back to BigQuery here, and we'll refresh. And this generally takes about five seconds, so pretty fast. And now we have the BQ ticker table here. 
And we can do, uh, let's take a look at the schema here, and you can see um, it's basically got a schema that, you know, uh, it's, it's got a lot more kind of level, layers that are in here. Um, but the things you generally care about are kind of like you have your, um, your t.symbol, t.close. In fact, what we'll do here is we'll grab the close date, um, the close price on, um, on Halloween, let's say. So t.close.sell.value from, um, what's this thing called? Demo.bq underscore ticker, where row key equals, I'll say gug, and we'll say um, underscore 2016, 1031. Okay, we'll run this, and we get a, a closing price of seven seven hundred eighty-five dollars, basically on that day. Um, but you know, this is BigQuery, so you, so you can already do spot lookups inside a big table. That's not very interesting. Um, so you can do some more interested, interesting sorts of things. Um, so let's look at say all of the. Let's try and get the min and max for the entire month of of last October. So because the values are strings, you want to cast them to floats. Um, we're going to indicate that the min here is uh, the min of the low for the month is, is going call, to be called low. The max of the high is called high. And uh, we're going to give it a row key range. Um, we're going to say it's going to be between this and this. So um, we could even do a prefix. You could say, you know, you could have a, basically a row key prefix and just say it goes up to 2016.10. It'll basically do the same thing. So we do that and we find out that the low for the whole month was $770. The high was $816. All right. Um, but usually, like you, when you're plugging this into reporting engines, you want to be able to do more interesting things, um, like build histograms of data. Um, so if you can do something more, uh, oh, here we go. Um, so let's look at a histogram of the highest high and the lowest low of each month uh, ever since Google went public. Um, so you run that, and after 1.3 seconds, we've got our answer back. We've got uh, the, basically the, the range for each month for all uh, 151 months that the, that the stock has been trading. So, um, so that's just showing the raw functionality, but I think you know, what gets interesting is when we can actually, uh, when we can actually turn, this into, um, turn this into some kind of visualization. And for that, uh, George is going to come up and uh, show us eye charts. So can we switch back to the slides, please? Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, George. Uh, that's pretty incredible stuff. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm not going to do a demo yet. <laughs> Another demo. All right. So just for anybody who doesn't already understand or know what iCharts does, uh, we help our folks like yourselves understand the trends that are in massive, massive amounts of data uh, so that uh, it can help you answer questions and make decisions and drive actions that can drive your business. And, and so some of the things that our customers really like about us uh, is the simplicity, easy to use. Uh, it's a drag and drop type of uh, interface. And it's not to say that we are trying to hide any of the power. We actually um, do give you some of the power as well uh, to do some really native stuff uh, within our interface. And I'm going to show you some of that. Um, also, you know, multiple levels of aggregation, so you can drill down into the details of the data while still seeing those higher levels of, of aggregation in, in, a def in a hierarchy that you define on the fly within the interface. And something else that's really important is single sign-on, um, being able to use Google OAuth to get into our platform. Um, and that's really important for folks who don't want to have another username or password. It simplifies the whole data management, um, and it also enables embeddability, whereby you, know, you can use our visualizations or the entire reporting system within the products that you're already using. Um, just a simple example is if you have a dashboard, you could put that into Google Sites, or you, know, you could put a chart in Google Slides. So how do we work? You know, we start at the visualization layer. Uh, to us, everything needs to be a visualization because that's, that's the goal. That's, those are the questions that you're trying to answer. Those are the decisions that you're trying to make. Um, and so that's where we start. You know, except for you know, this demo, I'll be going into a little bit more of the, uh, the meat and the details and peeling back the cover to show you how it's all working. Um, and then what our system basically does is it takes that visualization configuration 
and creates a dynamic query that includes all the calculations and aggregations, uh, segmentation, filtering, windowing, all that wonderful stuff, and parses it out into the APIs like Google BigQuery's API. Gets all the data back, pushes it back to the user, where they can then interact with it. So before I get into the demo, got a bit of a confession to make. Uh, we've, uh, we've never worked with Bigtable at all before. We've never done any kind of integration or anything. Um, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so, uh, but that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about this, because uh, now we can offer this to the customers that we have that have Bigtable data. Um, and then they could access all that information alongside their BigQuery information uh, in one single place. Uh, and that also helps with the, the simplification of data management. Uh, and they can also query on it using SQL, using the language that they already kind of know, those analysts already know SQL. Um, and most importantly, I think, really, is, is the fact that they can take this unstructured data that they have in one system and combine it with structured data that they have in another system and see it all cohesively in a single visualization and report. Uh, but I think the most important thing for us as a, as a company is that we didn't have to do any work. So I, I really like that. Uh, so yeah, um, on with our demo. Uh, if you could switch back over here. Awesome. And a little bit also about iCharts. Uh, we run on standard SQL. As Carter mentioned, uh, they're still doing some query optimization, so things might run a few seconds slower. Oh my god. Might have to wait a couple seconds for things to load up. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Carter just showed, and I'm going to pick it up where he left off, is uh, that query that was showing uh, a histogram of the Google stock ticker over months, right? So I did a little conversion over to standard SQL. It was really simple to do. Just a few, uh, few lines that needed to be changed. Uh, plenty of documentation on that. And uh, I'm already logged into iCharts through Google OAuth. Just refresh the screen, make sure that uh, I'm still here. Uh, and I have access to all the data sets and all the projects that I already had access to. So my BigQuery, there's that demo data set that he created. Um, here's the stock ticker uh, data set. And I can actually use that query as a data set. I could drive directly by the um, the tables themselves, but I wanted to use this particular use case uh, as an example. So I'm just going to paste the query in there. I've already done this a few times. Practice makes perfect. Well, uh, and I'm going to go create this data set. Actually, you know what I'll also do is I'll take this query and run it in the BigQuery console as well, so you could kind of see uh, oh, show options. Disable legacy SQL. Get rid of cache results also. So right now, it's basically running the same query on, actually, I think it returned already. I'll hide the options. Uh, it didn't take that long at all. So we see the same exact data that we saw in Carter's original demo. It's there. OK. Uh, so now I'm in our editor, and we have the fields that I've defined in that query. So we have the month, the low, and the high. And I can basically take this and replicate the same exact output that Carter showed us and that, that I just showed you in the BigQuery console. Um, it's going in. It's basically getting every single month out of that data set, piping it through BigQuery's API, and then going down into the uh, big table through the federated query system. And now it's going to basically do the same thing and get the highs. Uh, and it's also aggregating it at the same time. So if, if, if it were kind of row level information not pre-aggregated through a query, then you'd basically uh, be able to see a sum where you can also choose things like account, average, min, max, distinct, um, or uh, you could do other things, which I'll show in a moment. So yeah, this is great. You know, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, but I, I promised a visualization, so I'm going to show a visualization instead. Uh, and we'll see how. Basically, all of this, which is kind of difficult to interpret just by reading it, you know, a few, a few hundred rows, but this is much easier, right? 
You, know, you can obviously see, hey, if I invested in Google in the beginning of time, uh, I'd be doing pretty well right now. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, if, if you had done that, you had, you'd be uh, 10x your uh, original investment, maybe even more. Uh, but most people, they don't have just one stock symbol in their portfolio. They didn't just put all their eggs in one basket. They have, they're, they're diversifying. They're putting, they may have multiple portfolios. Uh, and if you're building an application that uh, is for portfolio trading or some kind of trading application or brokerage ca application, you're dealing with thousands or even more uh, portfolios that, that contain hundreds of thousands of ticker symbols in them um, with you know, billions and billions of trades. Um, not just the purchase, but every single time you've made a trade, uh, that's being recorded. Uh, and so that's kind of the next use case that I wanted to show you, uh, really about how can we combine this information here that's coming from big, big table with some other data which, we, which would represent my portfolio um, within BigQuery. And I'll just uh, take a look at BigQuery here, show you what my portfolio looks like. Can hide this. It's a, it's a basic table, you know, portfolio name, ticker, purchase date, when I purchased the, uh, the stock, how many shares I purchased, what was the price that I purchased it, right? Um, so I've got another query oh, below. And you could do this all within our interface, but I think it's important here to kind of show the, the core SQL. So just, uh, this is a little bit more of a technical audience. And so what, what this query actually does is, you know, it's basically basic select command, taking the information from my portfolio, taking some of the information from the, uh, the ticker table that's in, driven from big table, uh, doing the from, from the portfolio, joining it, just like you would join any, any two tables together. Um, but it's great because these two tables are in different systems. Uh, so, and just joining it on the cell, and then we basically have a little bit of optimization here where you're saying, okay, the row key is from between the time that I purchased the stock until the present time. Uh, and it's doing some pre-aggregation for us as well, just to make things fun. If I could copy and paste this. I can even use this as a data set. You know, just basically create a user entered query here, give it a name, portfolio by month. Create a data set. And I'll also show you what it looks like on BigQuery itself. Give you an example of what happens on Query. Hide options. All right, wow, that, that was fast too. Uh, so here now I have every single portfolio, all the tickers, when I purchased the shares, how many shares I purchased, the purchase price the price uh, and the month together. So price is actually the price during that month. Uh, and you know what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to do a little uh, something extra here because yeah, the, the price of the shares currently versus the number of shares that I have uh, is great, but I actually want to see what the value is that, that is uh, currently existing in my portfolio uh, or how it's changed over time. Uh, and that's really straightforward, simple calculation. I'm just going to multiply purchase, purchase shares uh, to price. Uh, and, you know, certainly you could have created a view to do this, uh, but it's, I think it's more important to actually do it with directly within the data set layer, within our semantic layer, because um, if this were a more complex query that uh, was put onto a uh, pre-aggregated data set, uh, then you know, you'll lose the capabilities of filtering and drilling down into the data. So it's more important to have that directly within our layer than trying to do it on, on the, directly within the data. 
So I'm just going to copy that and uh, edit our data set. And I'm just going to call it value. Value. Uh, I'm going to give it a float. Paste in my thing. And uh, you know what? I'm actually also going to do a little extra formatting just so it looks good. OK, so now I could create a pivot table directly on this data. Uh, and so what I'll do is I'll take the portfolio name that I have. Uh, and what it does is goes directly into BigQuery automatically, gets all the portfolio information out. Uh, and then maybe I want to see the, how each portfolio has evolved over time. Take that, put that into uh, the columns. And you know what? I'll also add it to the filter. As my trading started in 2014, but uh, maybe I'm only interested in maybe the past six months. So I'll just pick a date range from end of February to October sounds nice. And then I'll take the value, which is the calculation that I entered in to our semantic layer, and I'll add it right within there. Uh, so now it's actually going and creating that query that breaks it down by portfolio name over the trading months and multiplying the purchase price or the, the current price for each individual month by the number of shares. So I could see each individual uh, stock, uh, each individual portfolio and how they've evolved over time. Uh, but this is great, but maybe I want to get in a little bit more detail. What about each individual stock ticker? Uh, so I'll just drag this into, uh, into our rows, and it'll perform the same kind of query over again, but drilling into each individual stock ticker. And now we see energy, every stock ticker, all the individual uh, amounts, financial, and what it's doing here is we have, great, we have the individual amounts, but we also have the higher level aggregation based off of that hierarchy that I defined. Um, I, could, I could make it, if, if there were some other data here, I could switch these things around. Or what I could also do is I could take the trading month, and maybe I don't want to see it on the columnar level. I want to basically put that up into the rows and show it in kind of a, a really more hierarchical level. So I could see now for the month of... Uh, October 2016, uh, which is the, is the first month that I filtered by, I'm seeing that the total value is uh, 30,000. I'm not doing too bad. Uh, I can also, I don't know how to double click on your, uh, on your laptop. <laughs> uh, and I can see every single month over time. Cool, but again, what does this look like? When I just switch this over to a, uh, a line chart or maybe even an area chart, and so we could actually see how this has come over time. So this is past six months. Maybe I just want to see it from, from the beginning, all the way back into 2014, back in the day. Uh, this might be a little bit easier to read. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my portfolio. And I'm, I'm doing pretty well. You know, maybe only 6x, not as good as if I just in, in, invested in, in Google from the beginning. Um, but I'm seeing also there's, there's a little dip. And I'm wondering where, where, where the heck's that's coming from? You know, I could tell that somewhere in, in February or April, February, that, uh, that this dip has. And like, where's that, where's that coming from? Because uh, it looks pretty drastic here. Uh, but if you if you you know if you get into the details, what we might see is a, is a little bit of a different story, more detailed story. So I'm actually going to take the portfolio and take the same exact chart and segment it by the portfolio of every single trade. Goes in, creates the query that says, um, "Give me the per, uh, give me the current value." of every one of my stocks in every single one of my portfolios for all the months that I want to display. 
And so what I'm actually seeing here is that um, my, it's not such a massive drastic drop. What I'm actually seeing is that my health port, my, the, the stocks in my health portfolio and even a little bit of my stocks in my financial portfolio has experienced a bit of a downtrend for over, over the course of a year. Um, and, and at the same time, I've got a nice big increase in my tech stocks portfolio. Uh, so there was just kind of a slow-moving downward trend and a nice sharp upward trend for a couple of things. Uh, and this is, this is the exact type of questions that people have uh, that until now they wouldn't be able to dynamically answer. Uh, and especially with data that comes from multiple sources that they want to combine into one, this is, uh, this is pretty groundbreaking stuff. So can we switch over back to the presentation mode? So you could try it out if you want. Go for it. iCharts.net slash Google Pivot. It's available now. Uh, again, we, we use standard SQL. All that uh, good optimization is coming real soon. You could ask Carter about it. And, uh, but really, I want to thank Carter and the team for creating this. It's, uh, it's incredible. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, George. Thanks. That's, uh, that, it's a really cool tool. Uh, I mean, what's really neat is he didn't do anything. He just pointed at the BigQuery and can drag and drop and get a lot of uh, a lot of information on the data that's already there. Uh, where if I wanted to do that with a with a MapReduce, you know, I'd be I'd be programming for about two hours uh, to try and get that uh, get whatever, get the same results. Um, so quick recap. Um, so as of today, you can analyze big table data using BigQuery. Uh, it is row range optimized for the legacy SQL. The, uh, the row range optimization for standard SQL is coming soon. That's why his queries were taking eight seconds and not two seconds. That was our fault, not his. Uh, in a couple of weeks, the standard uh, SQL will also be as lightning fast as the legacy SQL. And uh, in, in short, you get the best of both analytical data stores by using this connector. Um, so thank you. There is a URL here. Um, that you're welcome to uh, go take a look at the documentation to show you how to uh, you know, set up a connector and play around with it. And um, you know, be, be interesting to see what you, what you find. It's in beta right now. Um, so you know, we're, we're always eager to hear your feedback. Um, that is the end of our presentation, but we have some time for questions uh, for anyone who's not running off for beer right now. But if you are running off for beer, I do not, uh, I do not begrudge you, because I, I would. <laughs>